formato de entrevista, discussão, que vai contar aí com a participação do doutor Mirko e doutora Eliane, que também eu tô, é, também já está entrando aqui para participar conosco. Gostaria de, já de antemão, deixar aqui registrado que agradeço muito a participação dos colegas, uh, doutor uh, Gatinel, doutor Mirko, enfim, né, agora boa tarde, porque lá na, lá na, na, na Europa, aí para os colegas, uhum. é, e obrigado. Eu vou fazer as introduções uh, uh, oficiais, serei uh, completo. E daqui a pouquinho, acho que o pessoal já está com a gente. Eu estou falando aqui, doutor Gatinho Nel. Vamos ver se agora ele... Professor, o senhor... Professor, o senhor uh, consegue... Damian, Damian, uh, can you hear us? I hear you now, it's perfect. Perfect, good, good. Now we are all set. Uh, we are just waiting for Mayumi. Uh, is she in or not yet? So I think we should start with uh, Damian. So uh, he has, he's doing that during his lunch time. We should thank you enormously for your help uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to our to our guests and um, Damian is for the ones that don't know uh, he's a brilliant ophthalmologist and mathematician he has a, his PhD thesis on mathematics has <clears throat> many different patterns especially in optics <clears throat> including intraocular lenses design and he is, in my opinion, uh, the person that most understand uh, optics and wavefront and aberrometry in the world. Uh, when we have Mirko Yankov to uh, interview him, we will have so much information and so much knowledge in one screen that I'm not sure if my computer will be able to, to handle that. So. Thank you very much for all of you. Uh, Mayumi just entered, and uh, we should um, we should start now. I pass it to um, Philippe Taguchi, who's our host, to to begin the session. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone in Brazil. Good afternoon, everyone in Europe. And as I was uh, stating before, and Wallace has already. Um, introduce Dr. Uh, Gatinel. I'd like to thank uh, enormously for your uh, participation and also our colleagues uh, Eliane Mayumi and Mirko Yankov as well. Uh, so, I, if I could I'd just lovely, introduce, uh, um, Felipe, I'm sorry for that, but uh, if I could no, just no. introduce um, Mayumi and Mirko. So Mayumi is a cataract and refractive surgeon from Sao Paulo, extremely knowledgeable on um, eczema laser surgeries, intraocular lenses. Uh, she was the head of our sector here at the Escola Paulista de Medicina a few years ago, and she's still a very good friend. Uh, Mirko, Mirko uh, is from Serbia, Belgrade, did his uh, medical school in Serbia and uh, his residency here in Brazil. He speaks four, five or six languages as far as I know and uh, he'll be joining us. He's, he's one of the seminal, the seminal works on, on uh, Wavefront came from Mirko. So it is really a pleasure to have you all and we'll do our best to try to understand what they say, right? So, uh, Damian, uh, if you want to, to begin your presentation, you can share your screen. Okay, I'm trying to do that. It's, um, I think, okay. Is it working now? Yes, do you see the first slide? Yes, uh, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, first, uh, thank you for this uh, very nice inv invitation. I wish I would be with you in Brazil, but uh, uh, obviously the time is not really <laughs> easy for those kind of things as we did in the years before. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, so uh, when I was asked to participate, I was happy because it would be an opportunity to discuss with you. Um, uh, or however, I must tell you that the, the, the topic, the title is very broad. And I discussed with my a little bit and uh, she told me, you know, maybe. Let me, uh, Damien, we are having a small problem with your connection. If you turn off your video, uh, your camera, it may be better. Can you try it again? Did it cut you? Eu acho que ele caiu, professor. Oops. Ok. So, enquanto ele está entrando novamente... Uh, Mayumi. Oi, oi. Bem -vinda. Não tinha Tudo dado bem, tempo vocês? Falar. <risos> Tudo bem? Tudo Seja bem. Tudo bem. Uh, Eu tô falando, deixa eu falar aqui com o Gatinão. Ele tá, acho que... É, eu achei que era o meu, porque eu também tive dificuldade de conectar aqui, achei que era o meu computador, que a conexão tá ruim, mas acho que é o dele mesmo, né? É o dele, é o dele, é sempre é o do, é o do, de quem tá apresentando. Gostei do Mei na cano, Mayumi. <risos> Cada hora eu ponho um bloco aqui. <risos> uh, e aí, vocês o, estão o bem, Dan... todo mundo? Todo mundo bem, todo mundo ótimo. Mirko, quer fazer algum comentário da aula? Ainda não. <risos> o seu áudio, Mirko, o seu áudio. Eu já falei tudo que tinha que falar. É, quando começamos com a com o Wavefront, eu lembro que foi na, na época que o Zyder veio para o Brasil, 97, aí fez uma aula e toda essa luta naquela época que era o laser, que era acho que 216, depois de 217, assim, a, a, a Long, e o Wavefront veio como meio do nada, assim, não, não tinha nenhuma coisa, ninguém ouviu falar. E... Uh, Todas as coisas que falava e toda a luta do Wayford, na verdade, era mostrando aquela supervisão e tudo isso. E hoje em dia, depois de 15, 20 anos de toda essa história, não tenho certeza que o Wayford, na verdade, tenho certeza que o Wayford não é aquilo que eu achava que ia ser. O papel da, da Wayford, da, da análise de medida e de tratamentos, é muito diferente do que eu achava. Eu achava que a gente poderia melhorar muito a visão, mas na verdade o que a gente fez é fazer os tratamentos padrões do, do laser muito melhores do que eram antes. E ainda os casos que são muito aborrados podem ser, além disso, feitos com cirurgia mais personalizada, mas o maior, para mim, durante 15 anos, a contribuição desse Wavefront é as medidas corretas e fazer a cirurgia não personalizada, padrão, muito melhor do que antes. Isso é um comentário geral. Vamos ver o que vai. Ele voltou agora. O... Damien, let's okay. try it again. Can you hear us? That at least if we want to focus on optics and refractive surgery, I think what is most important is to uh, focus on aberrometry and uh, everything we we have beyond the classic refraction, which we all know and. We could discuss that, but that's maybe another topic. So mostly to me uh, in refractive surgery, the, the, the benefit of aberrometry is two ways. The first is to do refractive guided surgery and the other way is to um, uh, qualify and quantify the visual symptoms of unhappy patient who have still good visual acuity, but complain about monocular diplopia, complain about halo, glare, etc. 
So those are the symptoms that you may find in patients. And every time I think you have a halo or a situation where the patient has issues like that, you could probably try to investigate those things and use aberrometry wisely for, again, those symptoms that you must have the patient explain with words. Sometimes you can have them drawing what, you, uh, what they see. And everything which is uh, uh, linked to aberrometry will be expressed like smeared image, ghosting, halo, glare, etc., etc. Uh, in where with uh, treatment or in diagnosis to take care of the optical set of vision. So for the resident and the young people, vision is a very complex thing, but you can at least make it less complex if you divide it in two steps. The first step, the step, and the step, and the first step, and the first step, Get to know, get to know. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Uh, your connection is a little poor. If you turn off your video, it may it may improve. Your video, not the screen. Mm -hmm. Let's I see did if it, it improves. No, not I'm yet. Mute. No, you're not mute, but your video is ah, too. My video, my own video. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No <laughs> Let's so, see if it improves now. Yes, uh, I don't know how to do. Uh, I'm trying to do this. Oh, it's working. It's working. You go ahead. Okay. So um, yeah, so we all know about the classic uh, kind of um, uh, defo uh, defocus issues. Uh, what, what in laboratory we do more is to um, uh, yes. Yeah, to improve the retinal image. And again, uh, what we do is, yes, is it okay? Can you well, hear me? Well, see, perhaps, perhaps see if everybody turns off the video, no, everybody. No, it doesn't change. No, it doesn't change, uh, Mayumi. Uh, let's try again. It's still a little bit bad, um, but let's try again. Got to know. Okay, is this better now or uh, it, now it's okay? But it sometimes it it starts to to get a bad sound. Let's see it again. Continue. Let's see. I'll let you know if it doesn't work. Yes, just so to to really introduce the the topic. What we do is we we try to take care of the rays refracted. Not focus at the same location and the central rays. That's what the truth about. So, refraction is controlling the central ray pencil, whereas the other um, three uh, higher vibration are uh, related to rays refracted at the pupil periphery. So, and that goes to everything which goes around the center. Uh, uh, we can't hear you. Unfortunately, no, no uh, the connection can, is can, really poor. The connection is really poor. It, it's funny because now I can, but when you start talking uh, during the talk, uh, we can't. Let's try once more. Let's try once more. Continue. Can we try by phone maybe? Is there, is there a way? No. no. If you call me and uh, on WhatsApp. Uh, yeah, that, that'd be an option, but yeah. Continue, and uh, if not, we're going to put your sound through me here. Mm -hmm. But let's see. So, Let's try again. Try again. Okay. Um, so um, what I was explaining is that in aberrometry, we, we want to define what happens in the periphery of the pupil. Uh, and uh, good vision requires that so all... I'll call you. I'll call you. It's okay. uh, I will call you on the WhatsApp mm -hmm. and I'll put your sound here. Is that okay? Can you, can you? Yes. Hello? Okay, just a second. Just a second. Just a second. Try to speak. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Do you hear me? I, I... Yeah, try. So I have to 
thank you. I can shut my microphone. Yes, please. So I shut my microphone, but I'm going to reopen it to ask you if it's okay. No, it's okay. We so can... Is it okay when I speak on the phone? On yeah, the phone? we can hear you now. We can hear you now. Okay. So what I'm doing... Just shut your microphone. Is I, will, I will stop my microphone and, yeah. uh, and continue to talk. Okay. If there's a problem, you can call me back. Okay. Okay. So um, I hope it's better. So yes, so everything we, we do in Aberometry is to control all the ray through the pupil, not only the central ones. Um, so um, when we when we do this, uh, we can explain sometimes why patients have halos like this, glare, etc. Again, by understanding that, for example, there's more uh, myopia in the periphery of the pupil than in the center. That's called positive circular aberration. So for those who are not familiar with this, again, think that what is refraction is not the whole story. And uh, refraction is again more or less controlled by how central rays focus, whereas visual quality relates to how peripheral rays are focused. And um, this is, uh, again, a classic uh, wavefront aberrometry acquisition. So maybe the video does not play well, but if you have an OPD scan, you can uh, really know how to, what's going on. And again, you see refraction and uh, topography, etc. And all this will provide people with data related to uh, spherical aberration, aberrometry. But more importantly, to one map, which I like because it's in diopters, and as you can see, it speaks to doctors. Uh, it's showing here a metropia. Here you have a uh, dioptric map. This is the local refractive error. So again, in aberrometry, what we look at is the homogeneity of the refraction. If you have myopia at the edge, a metropia in the center, that's called again positive circular aberration. The patient is emetropic, but the visual quality is not very good. So this is a normal uh, examination. On the other hand, you see there are fluctuations caused by higher order aberration. That's why the power is not constant, but it's not a big problem. A perfect patient will have no, uh, without higher order aberration, has a kind of constant defocus. Here is perfectly ametropic. Here is, it would be perfectly myopic, but again, this is not real life, and high elaboration are fluctuations around a metropia, like here, comprised between usually uh, three quarters of uh, diopters on each side of a metropia. Um, so, uh, if you have a patient with issues, you can show this uh, white circle and ask the patient to to. Uh, um, the patient to draw what he sees and when he draws things like that uh, it shows that he has a monocular diplopia ghost images and you can try to relate this uh, again with uh, with uh, aberrometry same for this e letter which is uh, seen in double so for all these situations you need wavefront sensing so wavefront sensing will provide you with usually maps which are not in diopters but in micron and in micron you have numbers which are usually difficult to interpret because they are related to the pupil diameter so there's no like uh, sound thresholds for saying that's good that's bad that's okay you need to do a comparison and with experience you can have ideas but it's difficult so in aberrometry, what we do is we uh, collect light refracted outside the eye. And to understand this, it's, it's, uh, it's better to um, uh, have a, a comparison between two eyes. One, eyes. one eye being a metropic is the eye with, as you can see, um, um, converging rays to the same focus. And aberrated eye, like with the character conus, will have rays again focused in different areas. To make it simple, the wavefront can be conceived as the uh, local 
perpendicular direction to each ray. And if you do this on that kind of ray pencil, you will have a perfect sphere. And here you will have like a distorted sphere. And uh, that's a uh, uh, first approach. But again, if you have the wave front, you can compute the point spread function, which is the image of, uh, for example, bright star, which would be very far away here. And here, as you can really understand, the light will not be focusing at the same location. So when you measure wave front, you do it outside the eye. You cannot measure the wave front inside the eye. It's impossible. So the idea is that you collect light reflected from the fovea and because optics works both ways you can have a comparison between a perfect eye which has a spherical wavefront inside the eye and a perfectly flat wavefront outside the eye with an eye which has a perfect spherical wavefront going through the eye but as it goes through the lens and the cornea it becomes distorted so if you compare the two wavefronts here like this you can measure the differences and the differences will be measured in microns. You can do like a sum of the square to get rid of the sign issues between negative and positive here, um, uh, phase shifts. And once you have that, once you have a reference and uh, the local deviations, you take there to the square, you make a sum, a mean, and you take the square root. Then you have what's called the RMS, and that's what we I've seen just as number a bit before. So to give you some idea in aberrometry, for a six millimeter pupil, okay, very important, it's a bit like with diopters, from half of it, half a micron and more, you will see patient complaining, especially if this is for a specific aberration. So this is a basic thing. And when you see maps like the wavefront map, what you see is local deviation, of course, in the pupil. But again, it's not in the optics, no, it's on, it's on micron. The idea is to express this with a simple basis of functions. And usually people, until now, they have used the um, Zernicki aberrations, who, which are interesting because they, con they correspond for low order aberration to sphere and oblique and with or against the rule cylinders here. And from this line and below, you have what's called the high order aberration, which address uh, irregular astigmatism. So the first aberration top of the pyramid is uh, the tilt. It's like a null aberration. The prism now, which is uh, a bit uh, like what you would see if you send light through a prism, it will deviate. And um, defocus, so positive or negative, myopia or uh, hyperopia and uh, that's for example a myopic eye with, with the focus this is the wavefront here and you can see that when uh, the uh, wavefront exits the eye the low, low order aberration focuses here because uh, the sphere here is is explained by the punctum remotum which is finite distance so the wavefront converges through to the punctum remotum and if you analyze the shape here we, it will be analogous to a quadratic uh, function for astigmatism it's a bit uh, different it's uh, a kind of a chip shape saddle shape to reflect the different uh, curvatures of meridian giving rise to differential phase advance or retardation regarding the azimuthal orientation in the pupil. So that's a typical wavefront for um, low order astigmatism. Then you see the uh, higher order aberration, like coma and trefoil here, uh, which are interesting, and you find them usually in keratoconus. The mathematical expression is a bit tricky, but this number relates to the number of oscillation of the function, which is a sine or a cosine. Negative is a sine, positive is a cosine. And here it's the shape polynomial here that controls for the total uh, higher number polynomial. So if you have a R to the power of three, this is a kind of shape. So if you multiply this shape by that shape, you obtain in three dimension the trifold shape with, uh, again, the power between a sine and a cubic shape. All right, so 
coma is what you see in catoconus usually, and it's a, a, an aberration which is again a high order mode that reflects uh, a difference between half of the pupil and the other half of the pupil. So if you want me to show you how it relates to topography, that's I think uh, educational and interesting. When you have irregular astigmatism, if you know a bit uh, what's going to happen, you will have regular astigmatism and irregular astigmatism. What you can understand is that if you have a perfect regular astigmatism, and if uh, the power on 360 degree circles like here, from the flat to the steep meridian, you will have an increase in power, a decrease, an increase, and a decrease. And here you see a, sinu a perfect sinusoid. If you do the same, and that will be regular astigmatism. But if you now have a irregular astigmatism, asymmetric bow tie, if you do the same experience, flat, steep, flat, steep, the second mi meridian here being steeper, you will have that kind of shape. And because you have that kind of shape, uh, you need a sine uh, curve and a coma curve to um, reconstruct that. So when you have a symmetric bow tie, you can understand easily why you have wave front uh, in the uh, optical aberration. If you add trifold to regular astigmatism, what you will find is that the total signal, the peak will go close to one another and you will have an asymmetry. And usually when you have this, it's when you have a asymmetric bow tie and a srax. The srax is caused by some trifold. And um, again, if you have trifold, I mean, if you have a srax on the topography, may, you may expect some trifold at the corneal wavefront or even total eye wavefront uh, thing. So that's a bit a way to relate the high order aberration and topography. So Mayumi told me that she wanted me to allude in um, to what the work we have been doing for my PhD, uh, and this, it was made with mathematicians. But the question was that, are we happy with Zernikis? And obviously to me the answer was no, because Zernikis failed to predict refraction and also failed to predict the accurate higher order Im retinal image for reason i'm going to explain again we have to go back to the basics of wavefront analysis what's a low order aberration it's a myopia or astigmatism and it's called low aberration because it's uh, described by a polynomial shape which maximum degree is two so parabolic shape whereas when you have a higher order aberration the shape is more distorted so you need, for example, coma cubic function or air to the fourth power for spherical aberration. But if you do cross section of those modes, they are flat in the center. And that's okay because, again, I explained to you that aberration, the higher order aberration should not influence refraction. If they influence refraction too much, they are low order aberration. They contain some low order aberration. And that's the problem with the Zernike. When you have the high order wavefront, you use it to predict the point spread function. And from the point spread function, you can predict the retinal image. But if your wavefront is not accurate, this will be wrong and this will be wrong as well. So it's quite important. It all starts with the wavefront uh, decomposition. And with Zernikis, if you look at them, the higher order modes are not flat in the center. Look at the straight collaboration look at the higher order astigmatism. Low order aberration are less distorted in the center somehow than some high order modes. That's a big problem. And the reason for that, again, is that there are modes in the Zernikis, I'm sorry for this busy slide, that have low order terms embedded with the high order terms. So coma is containing some tilt. And three collaboration contains, you see, the focus. This is a mathematical expression. So the higher order Zernikis are not pure high order. They are contaminated by uh, the, 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 the low order modes. So 
That's why I don't believe they are well suited for relevant ophthalmic clinical interpretation and prediction. I'll give you an example that we all have in refractive surgery, the unhappy 2015 uncorrected patient who should be happy, but she or he tells you that at night he sees halos. This is the Zerniki higher order predicted retinal image. And it's completely odd because the visual acuity predicted here is very low. Again, the patient uncorrected is 2015. If you look at the Zerniki, the patient is emetropic postoperatively, but, but the default very high, suggesting two diopters of myopia almost. And of course, there is positive circular operation. So the discrepancy um, shows here that the autorefractometry is okay, but the wavefront predicted sphere is minus one. This is a, a case also here of halo with emetropia, and retinal image also here is not good. And there is myopia predicted. So um, that's uh, a problem, and again, this is due to this uh, combination of low order terms in the high order mode. And uh, to make it simple in a nutshell, uh, positive recalibration contains hidden hyperopia, negative recalibration contains hidden uh, hyperopia and myopia. Uh, uh, so that's why when you do those C12 correction with the uh, Contura software of Alcon, they ask you to, to control for the defocus because they use their keys and they have issues like that. So typically, again, what happens is that when you have a patient with a high order wavefront like this, postoperatively flat in the center and in pure false power. With Zerniki, you have to reconstruct it with the Zerniki mode, which has defocus, and then the defocus must be canceled by um, uh, Zerniki defocus mode. So it's like compensation to recreate this wavefront, but that's not good. We should have a higher mode, which is pure in uh, its higher order um, contain, no defocus inside. That's why here you see defocus. This defocus is an artifact which is caused by the necessity to compensate for uh, the myopia which is contained in the positive secular aberration. So there is a hyperopia here. So you need myopia there to make it flat in the middle here. I hope it's clear. And um, this is again similar with coma. Coma induces tilt. For the same reason, coma in the journey key has tilt, but the wavefront is flat in the center usually. So you need tilt to make it flat. And this will show as tilt here in the journey key decomposition, but this tilt is to compensate for the tilt which is included in the coma. So it may sound a bit uh, academic, but think about higher order astigmatism. Usually that's what a patient with higher order astigmatism and only that has as a wavefront shape. If you use Zerniki's, you will have a lot of artifacts because there's low order astigmatism here in the higher order astigmatism of the Zerniki. And the, for one micron of pure high order astigmatism, you need almost the same low order astigmatism to balance the low order astigmatism in the Zerniki. So if you do wavefront guided treatment, with Zernikis, you may have problems because it will interfere with refraction and gives you headache to understand what's going on. So we have improved this and created a new classification to have higher order modes, which are pure in higher order terms. So this is a new classification. We call it LDHD for low degree, high degree. And um, the mode here, are flat in the center you see they don't interfere much with refraction and uh, the price we had to pay for the mathematical savvy are what uh, that they, we lose orthogonality but it's not a, bit, a real problem because we can still calculate rms for the higher order aberrations um, i'm going to skip this um, but Maybe that's interesting. If you want to understand why the why are the Zerniki impure, it's because naturally defocus and free collaboration are not orthogonal. So what Zerniki did 
he decided, and, and I show you vectors here instead of function because the geometry is usually easy to understand. So if you have your defocus here and your spherical aberration, they are not orthogonal. So you cannot calculate RMS easily. What you can do is project this vector onto this one and you have a vector here, which is a little bit of that one, but with a negative sign here. Now, if you subtract this vector to the initial one, you have a new vector here in red, which is orthogonal in R4, but it has to have a little of this one inside it to be orthogonal. So the paradox is to that if you want to create independent function, orthogonal to be able to compute RMS, in fact, you have to combine them. This is called Gram Schmidt process. That's exactly what happens with Zernikis. So some Zernikis to be orthogonal to one another, they must have the one below above them in the pyramid uh, subtracted. And that's again the problem. So again you have the same now with function. Uh, this is that. This was this, sorry. Here was this one and this is this one. But that explains why you have a summary row shape here. This is a mixture of the two vectors here to have them orthogonal. So here in our classification, we don't want these to be orthogonal with the low order. And because they don't have to be orthogonal, they can be free of low order terms. That's the explanation. So we have published this. You see the new modes in cross section. They are flat in the center. This is comma like mode. These are spherical collaboration like mode. And you see in the center they are flat, as should be in ophthalmology. You can compare three collaboration with the new classification, flat in the center, like not a sombrero, but a, a flat shape. The new comma flat in the center, and the new high order astigmatism, not as complex as the Zernicki one. So it's going to make uh, aberration more fitted. And to finish, I show you the comparison between two classifications. The Zernicki for the halo with defocus and spherical aberration becomes no defocus, no tilt, because tilt was an artifact because of the coma. The coma is better shown in the new classification, and the spherical aberration also is better. That's again, um, you see the coefficient much better now with the new uh, classification. This is the uh, vision predicted by Zernicki for, for a higher order, not accurate. This is the vision predicted by the LDHD classification, more related to the 2010-2015 visual acuity that the patient had. So um, that's explained again by Zernicki is a sombrero. It predicts wrong myopia. The retinal image is wrong. Point spread function is wrong because it has defocus. In the new classification, the wavefront is more accurate. The point spread function is a point with a halo around it, you can see here. Predicted refraction is emetropic, and re uh, retinal image for higher order aberration is also more realistic. So, and if you do MTF, etc., it's going to be the same. You can do the same for keratoconus and compare Zernikis to uh, LDHD. You see with Zernikis, you have an impression that you have a lot of tilt, a lot of low order aberration, whereas keratoconus creates more high order aberration. With the new aberration, you see the numbers are higher and you can really see that coma dominates here. Um, Retinal image prediction will be uh, with Zernicki usually uh, not as good as with the new classification. It works also the same for form free keratoconus. If you compare Zernicki's, here you see much better the higher order aberration with the new classification. And when you compare Zernicki predicted with LDHD predicted, usually asking the patient to, to predict when you show them a letter E. You see, there's usually better correlation with the higher order aberration prediction for the retinal image with the new classification than, than with this. Um, and same for astigmatism, it's usually better. Um, I'm going to maybe reactivate the microphone 
because there are two solutions. Everyone sleeps. I was disconnected and I spoke for no one. Or you're very happy and I will listen uh, some <laughs> clapping. <laughs> Uh, we we can hear you well, perfectly, as well. It's okay. It's perfect. Oh, great! So I should. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm gonna just turn off your my your speaker. Yes. yes. Um, hello. Yeah, perfect. Ah, uh, yeah, I can, I can talk to to over the phone now. Okay. Uh, yeah, it it is it is working perfectly. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, do you want us to uh, move on for the interview? Yes. Okay. Good. Good. So now, uh, I will go it to send it to Tagushi. Tagushi, it's all yours. Okay. So. Uh, thank I you, would, can I, uh, just, I, um, you will hear them. I will put this here. Just a second. Okay, I, I keep the screen on. I will take it out. Uh, it, 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 no, it out. Uh, okay. Can you say something, please, so we can test? Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Gatnell, do you hear? Yes, I hear you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, thank you for your great uh, class. Um, and I see you also. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I think that's a, a hard subject for most of us in the in in attending this this meeting. So, uh, that's maybe a relief for <laughs> many of our uh, of the watching us. But uh, we've brought together good specialists so we can uh, comment and discuss this matter. Uh, as Dr. Wallace has already introduced, Dr. Uh, Mayumi and Dr. Mirko, uh, I'd gladly uh, thank you for your participation. And if you could uh, start uh, making comments and questions, and we'll also uh, accept questions from uh, the chat. And if anyone wants to uh, make the questions on the microphone as well uh, for free. So, Dr. Uh, Mayumi, if you'd like to start. Hi, Damien. How are you? How are things there? Hi, good. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you very much for being with, with us today. Um, uh, well, the, to, to the people who didn't, didn't know, I first met Damien in 2004 or 2005, wasn't it? I don't remember it very well right now, but uh, at the time, we worked for uh, nine of the consultants, and Damien is still working with the company, as we saw. And thank you for sharing with us your, your knowledge and the, the development of this uh, new model of interpretation of the waveform. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I made some notes uh, of questions during your lecture. Uh, let me see. Uh, you said that the, 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 the terms extracted by the e, uh, HDLD can be, uh, it's, uh, can be extracted from a simple mathematical formula uh, of the way from uh, of the Zernick terms, wasn't it? Yes, you don't have to do another wavefront acquisition. It's a recombi we, we can recombine, we can calculate the new coefficients from Zernike coefficient directly. Okay, and Damien, what is the, what is the normal values of the uh, high order vibration, for example, for spherical vibration or for the total RMS that's expected for a normal eye? Because we know, uh, uh, well, for example, that in Zernike, uh, we expect Except something about 0 0.33 uh, of RMS, total RMS of the high order. But uh, what about in the EHDLD uh, method? Okay, can I take the screen back? I can show you. Sure, go ahead. Um, can, how do I do this? Okay. Um, is it okay now? Yeah, it will share. Just one minute. It takes a 
Yeah, now we have it. Okay, so that's the Zernike pyramid coefficient um, that you are referring to. You know, usually it's a uh, it's a bit busy, but you see um, it's all point something for the high order. And if you move to the um, LDHD, the coefficient are larger usually. Uh, it's uh, interestingly, it's closer to the optric range. Um, and the reason for that, you see the, the mean max here, you see, in the normal population, for example, coma is between two, uh, minus two plus two, uh, trifold minus one plus one, uh, um, three collaboration minus four up to plus one. Uh, so what you may not really um, believe is that Zernikes are minored, that is, they are minimized because Again, they are a mixture of low and high order terms, like three collaboration as the focus. So because of that, and for mathematical reason I'm not going to cover now, the coefficient is artificially minimized for, for those modes. So the true pure coefficients you see here are, to me, what the real uh, weight of the aberration is in the west front um, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, important because for clinicians it's difficult to interpret also 0 0.1 or 0.2 you don't really feel because we use usually dioptric differences of at least 0 0.25 and when you move to the uh, new mode LDHD uh, the coefficient are usually multiplied by six, let's say, for circulation, and by three for coma, and by four for secondary astigmatism. So, um, multiplied yeah. meaning that Zernikis are minimized by four for secondary astigmatism, by six for circulation, and by three for coma, let's say this. And you know, in, the other way to see this is for presbyopia surgery, when we manipulate three collaboration, when you use the new classification and you play with negative three collaboration, um, if you use two microns of three collaboration, it's about like inducing a difference of two diopters between the center of the pupil and the periphery of the pupil for about six millimeters. So that's quite interesting that by chance, there's a nice correlation into the difference, the different power brought by three collaboration with the classification. Is this answering your question? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, so in we, we all will have to learn again the, and memorize the new param parameters of the uh, what, what is normal in terms of high order aberration, right? Because we have already uh, hardly understood uh, what are in the Zernic uh, way of measuring it. And uh, for your, in your proposal, we will have to learn it all again. In, in principal terms, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, the current waveform guided ablations uh, of uh, high liberated eyes show a pretty good result um, in, in, in terms of uh, the post uh, laser, the post laser uh, treatment. What do you expect from the LG80 waveform basal guided ablation? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think uh, that um, I would expect many things like less in uh, better understanding of the relation between high order and uh, subjective refraction that's one thing because when we do uh, wavefront guided sometimes we have to enter the refraction and if we want to correct the higher order aberration we create sometimes confusion because uh, we have to adjust again the refraction for mm -hmm. people who use the wave light laser and contour ablation, what happens is that when they correct for higher order aberration, they correct the Zernike um, expansion. So the wavefront, which is the higher order wavefront, is not really pure in higher order uh, terms. So Alcon wants you to compensate for what the Zernike introduced. Uh, 
unexpectedly as low order operation. If we have a classification which is more uh, giving you a clear cut between the low and the higher order operation, then when you de design customized ablation, you know that what you treat is purely a higher order aberration component, not a mixture of uh, higher and low order uh, terms. So that's what I expect, of, of course. And uh, because the coefficients are higher as well, it's easier to identify probably the patient who would uh, benefit from higher order wavefront correction. Because in Zernicke, sometimes you don't look in the chart to every coefficient because they are very small and 0 0.3, 0 0.4. But here they pop up much better because of their non minimization. But I, I, I couldn't try it yet because no laser company has uh, moved forward from the journey keys and uh, it requires a little work, I think, still for that. Uh, Damien, uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask Mirko. Uh, to address uh, something, uh, is, is especially, uh, I, I'd like to understand one thing because when you say you have a, a different algorithm to reproduce the shape of the wave front, um, but if I'm, let's suppose we are not measuring, but we are aiming correction of all aberrations, uh, it really doesn't matter the algorithms or at least the polynomials. It is exactly. the, the, the total shape of it. Um, right. Um, and I'm, I'm worried because, as Naomi said, uh, the former Zernik and Fourier analysis of the waveform shape used to work quite well for correcting highly order of highly aberrated eyes. So, what should we expect? I'd like Mirko to, to add something to the question so he can go ahead on that. Yeah, well, I think that you, you just started the right the right way. If you actually, uh, uh, if you, let well, me just say, I can't watch myself. And if you uh, measure, capture the whole wavefront uh, and you apply it as a treatment, then there is no difference which way you, you interpret it. There will be difference if you started picking one or the other and then uh, those uh, 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 high order operations that are supposed to be independent, as Daniel nice to show, they are not independent. Um, I, my PhD thesis was, was also about the same, similar thing, only about uh, spheric aberration and the influence of spheric aberration to the refraction itself, to the defocus. And there, there is this uh, sidal aberrations that actually if you stack up the C4 and C12 and C24, you will most probably get the real refraction, which is more or less what you did with all the other uh, uh, high aberrations that you took out uh, the, the influence of the low order ones, which is, I, I think, the perfect idea. It makes all the sense. Now, my question is actually um, a little bit uh, uh, based by, down to the basis because I understand that most of the viewers are here the basic science, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, students. Now, uh, if, if I need to ask you right now, the wavefront uh, technology today, do you think that uh, the wavefront will be used more, is, is used more as a, a treatment option or as a diagnostic tool? What is more important? It is both, but what do you think is more, more important to, as a diagnostic tool or as a treatment tool for virgin me, no it's it's more a important as a diagnostic tool hmm. um and so so they, they just uh, this this is more or less what the uh, hello right there. stop now it was a very very hot question huh? no we, we lost you for a while for whatsapp yeah. you, can you repeat okay. it Yes, so I think diagnostic is more important as for now uh, than therapeutics because again, as been said by Wallace, if you treat the whole wavefront, you treat the whole wavefront and that's probably the best thing to do theoretically, I think. Uh, the problem in therapeutics is when you do correction at the cornea level for topography, high order aberration, then it's a problem because there's no refraction in the cornea somehow. So you need to probably uh, be more cautious. Uh, and we have um, a lot of patients who come for problems related to decentration, to small optical zone, to even in cataract surgery, IOL tilt uh, for complicated surgery. And 
sometimes I've seen people misunderstanding the the, 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 the real signification of the tears in the West Front. They confound the tears of the West Front with the IOL, etc. And that's bad. I think this is important in ophthalmology because if you are a doctor who, who is involved in optics in a broad sense, that comes that starts with contact lenses filling, cataract surgery, uh, and uh, of course refractive surgery. These are things you must master, I think, for complicated situation. And we all have complication. When you have a complication, that's where you make the difference uh, to your colleagues. If you understand reference aberometry, you can relate this to the patient symptoms and probably be better way to correct it. So diagnosis, diagnosis is important because it conditions the, 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 the treatment thereafter. Okay, the second part of the question is, uh, is also oh, related difficult. to what just, you just Just a second, Mirko. Can you repeat? He, he did not... Yeah, the, 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 sec, the, the continuation of the question is also related to uh, virgin eyes versus uh, complicated eyes, as you said. Now, we know that uh, we have a, a eye system that is made of two main optical elements, the cornea and the, the lens. We do have other things, but let's say only these two. Uh, in the virgin eye, uh, the influence of the high order vibrations, uh, they come uh, where from? From the lens or from the cornea? And the complicated eyes that you said, the defoc the, the decentered vibrations and stuff, where these aberrations come from? And then the, you know where the next question will be where to treat uh, where it comes from so uh, just uh, to, just to discuss about the virgin eyes and the real influence of the whole complete wavefront information and then the the, the highly aberrated eyes we can discuss afterwards well for for uh, young patients most of the higher order aberration arise from the cornea and of course when you get older and uh, you develop cataract you can have internal uh, high order aberration and then uh, when you do cataract surgery, you remove a lot of aberration, like, for example, negative spherical aberration in nuclear cataract, as you know, is usually found. Um, so um, it's, uh, it, it's important to have combined topographs and aberrometers because they help you to segregate between corneal aberration and uh, internal aberration. Right. So uh, this is exactly my point. I remember about 20 years ago when we started with the whole uh, wavefront technology with Professor Zeiler and Margaret McDonald in the US. And then there was the, the idea about uh, capturing the whole wavefront and treat, treating it uh, uh, on the cornea. Uh, but then uh, what you just nicely said, you have parts of the aberrations that are uh, from, from inside the eye and from the cornea. And the cornea will change with life, but not as much as the lens inside. So if we capture the wavefront of today or 25 year old uh, uh, person and imprint into the cornea, high order operations together with the low order ones, this lens will change uh, uh, throughout life. Uh, are we really supposed to use this wafer technology to imprint something that we know we will change or we should restrict ourselves to make the perfect uh, spherocylindrical spher spher correction which we know that will make uh, uh, this patient uh, 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 cornea and the whole refractive state of the eye correct, and then leave the high order operations that will change anyway for later, non corrected. Um, well, um, I think what is important is to um, um, uh, realize that uh, every case is a different one. And uh, of course, I think the best is to treat patients uh, at the corneal plane if the problem gets arises from the corneal plane and vice versa. Um, or, however, when we do myopic surgery, it's uh, you know a problem which relates to the actual length, and uh, um, we still make the cornea flatter and what we should do is shorten the eye. So sometimes the philosophy does not apply to the basic correction it, it, itself. But um, if, if I think for the young people, that situation is not often met because 
they usually have irregular astigmatism at the cornea and uh, you treat it at that plane. Um, so of course, ideally, we should locate higher order aberration, treat them from the cornea. Uh, if they are from the cornea, you treat them at the corneal plane and you leave aside what's internal. But it's quite also difficult to know exactly what's who is who and uh, sometimes you have to make choices and uh, and maybe compensate at the cornea things which are not from the cornea itself yeah uh, now uh, your your um, impression regardless of the numbers whether they were 0 0.3 0 0.5 but let's say uh, the in, in your new classification you said it's about 0 0.5 microns of rms that will be significant for for visual deterioration or did i or it was 0 0.3 was in the in the Zernike. 0 0.3 microns or 0 0.5? The Zernike, I microns? think, each, for the coefficients, you mean? Yes, for the RMS total. Well, total RMS is, I think, to me, it's uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 for a 6 millimeter pupil. Correct. Now, uh, so this is um, uh, this is more or less the same RMS value, the cutoff value for in your new, new classification, or it would be higher, as you said, the terms? No, it would be... It will be it will be way higher. Yeah. yeah. It will be higher. But you will, it will still be more. It. it will be like a bit diopteric, diopters. I think it will be close by, by chance. I mean, it's not made uh, on purpose, but it's mm -hmm. probably threshold comparable to to diopters like a one diopter of this or that. Probably because again, a basic convert uh, to convert. To have an idea for coma, not trefoil. Trefoil is fine. Trefoil is the same between the two classifications. But for coma, you can multiply by three for uh, spherical aberration by six, and for secondary astigmatism by four. So it's okay. three, four, six. Now, uh, one question uh, this is uh, related uh, to the virgin eyes versus uh, the complicated eyes. Uh, in the uh, in the former classification, uh, our experience was that maybe about five, uh, maximum ten percent of eyes would naturally have a, a significant high order aberration that would require they will fall into these limits. Let's let's say more than 0 0.5. Uh, mm -hmm. well, so theoretically, only those patients that uh, the virgin eyes that have uh, more than um, a threshold would actually require away from guard treatment. Um, now, why would we treat all the patients, even younger older ones? Why well, we treat all the patients uh, with wavefront guided when we uh, well they, they don't have enough higher operations to start with? Would would it be wise? I think the benefit of higher order aberration correction is not only the fact that you correct for the higher order aberration; it's because usually you pay more attention to refraction, and even if you don't. Uh, 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 adjust the refraction, the centration will be probably better. You will have probably uh, also indication to program the uh, accurate optical zone. You will be probably beneficiating for, from cyclo-rotation, uh, compensation, cyclo-torsion, etc., etc. So the reason why wavefront-guided treatment are better is probably not only uh, due to the higher order wavefront correction, but all the satellite extra steps that are usually taken for those treatments. And I think if you do for, for normalize the same thing, but you leave the higher order aberration aside, it's probably uh, similar results probably because patients they don't complain about their little coma or tray fall in daily life they don't really mention they don't it's when they get higher but to start with they complain from the myopia the astigmatism they it's more or less the low order aberration which are the target what you want is to correct them perfectly and not increase the higher order aberration so this is perfect. Uh, uh, this is exactly perfectly aligned with, with the same philosophy from 15 years ago. Is that uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. It just don't make things worse. And that that means that what you just said is very important. Uh, you pay more attention as a clinician if you have away from guided than when it's very bread and butter. It should not happen that way. Every single treatment, if it's minus half or minus five or minus whatever it is, is as important as the one that is more complicated. 
because you as a surgeon make, can make this different. The registration is ex extremely important. This is what you just said. Also the psychotorsion in these terms. So if you do the standard treatment, you as a surgeon, uh, you, using the technology that will make these things correct, then you don't need wave from guide treatment for those patients. Leave the topography guided or wave from guided treatment for those eyes that really have a problem because then these small psychotorsion or registration parts will only add up, but the real problem is there. That's right. I agree. Okay. Well, th these are, I think, just most important ones that I, uh, when I, that I had. And maybe, Wallace, you have some more questions. Yeah, you know, I would not like to disagree with you at this point. You have opportunities for that after or in other situations. That's my omis. Let my omis say something. Uh, I was uh, was going to agree with you. Um, actually, in term, in practical terms, we don't have access to uh, laser platform that used the waveform as a as a default, except for uh, physics, right? So the wavelength uh, we uh, the, at least the, the machine that we have available available here in the university, we have only uh, at the most the top guided ablation. So uh, I agree with Damian, with Mirko, and with you, all of that 100% uh, of the patients, even those who are primarily uh, uh, undergoing refractive surgery for a standard, a normal uh, refraction correction, should be uh, customized in terms of the waveform. But uh, in terms of uh, practical terms, Damian, Mirko, I, I know that you both have the wave light platform. Do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Uh, how do you deal in your daily routine? May I just add something uh, to that, Mayumi? Uh, uh -huh. uh, Damien, are you aware yes. that, uh, that there's a big company with a new uh, Wavefront uh, platform coming out? Oh, yeah, yeah. But oh, can you coming. tell us something about it? Uh, can you say I didn't listen well? Uh, it seems that there is an, another laser company or an, a laser company that is uh, launching a new uh, Wavefront platform. Are you aware of it? A new wavefront platform? Um, a company like maybe Schwind with the Pyramis or, or I don't think it's new. No, I've heard that Alcon is, has, but it, I'm not sure. Oh, yes, the, the, the Innovise treatment. This is like a ray tracing system. But wavefront uh -huh. based or not? Huh? Is it yes. wavefront based or not? Well, yes, it's. Um, there's a shark man inside, and uh, it's wavefront based, yes. And they use uh, an algorithm which uh, they describe as a ray tracing algorithm to calculate uh, the wavefront shape, high order aberration, and um, and uh, they do uh, some um, uh, optimization of the profile of ablation based on uh, uh, iteration. So. The idea is that you can have information in the treatment based to not only the wavefront but the topography as well, the actual length, um, because they they have in the same instrument a kind of a pentacam plus a biometer plus a Shackartman. So the, we we have this here. We will start the first treatment soon. Uh, it's called again Innovise, and. Uh, we hope that this may even further improve the quality of the vision of the patient. But it's for, for now, it's just for my hopes between minus uh, one and minus, uh, I think, uh, I mean, it's for my hopes, not hyper hopes. It's for virgin eyes, not complicated eyes. Um, so um, you would expect those treatment to be uh, um, used in complicated eyes, but by now, it's, it's more for um, um, normal eyes, uh, and uh, we will see. Uh, it requires a lot of examinations. Before that, you do several reference, several corneal topographies, some biometries, and then you can see the treatment and compare it to what you would have if you do a pure uh, wavefront optimized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, if you see differences, sometimes. You can feel like, okay, it may uh, really be good for that patient to, to get that treatment. Yes. I can tell you something about that. Uh, you know, uh, do you believe in conspiration theories? 
that is, uh, no, I mean, in general, this is a qu question to you and, and to Wallace, actually. Uh, it, do you believe in conspiration theories? You know, the UFOs have been here for a long time and all this stuff. But this yeah. is something that is real. Uh, I don't know, if, Wallace, if you remember, that you must have some of my slides from, from my PhD times. Uh, uh, that was 2002 or three. So the exact uh, uh, code name from, from that period at, at Wavelight of this project that you just said, Daniel, is um, uh, is the ray tracing um, uh, ray tracing ablation profile, and actually is is exactly what what you said. Uh, but it was on the uh, on the table of Wavelight in 2004 and five, and then it moved moving quite, quite slowly. Uh, and then when Alcon bought uh, Wavelight, it stopped completely for almost 10 years and now it started again. So I'm very happy that, uh, that uh, it started. And also exactly what you said were the limitation of the first study that was done it was uh, myopic eyes. But the idea about this is actually to make the, uh, uh, the answer to the questions, what kind of aberrations should you really uh, uh, correct? And especially in high myopia, as you said, uh, you, you change the, you, you're actually uh, flattening the, 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 the cornea instead of shortening the eye. So by flattening the cornea, uh, uh, shooting it still on the longer eye, you will create some aberration, the spherical aberration that is not supposed to be there. So the, the idea about the first iterations of, the, of this way tracing, what's now called, you said, you know, is it was to, to make this uh, spherical aberration non-existent by making it uh, uh, calculate the front, the back surface of the cornea, the position of the lens inside, uh, and the whole uh, wavefront um, the actual length and the wavefront aberration together. So that you, you can actually calculate which kind of uh, 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 ray tracing, if you correct uh, minus 10, uh, what kind of uh, uh, rays, what kind of higher aberrations you're going to produce in this site. So then you iterate and you say, okay, let's correct this uh, ablation a bit more. And then two or three times, you will actually get the uh, right uh, refraction or right ablation profile for the refraction with the, as these uh, 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 higher aberrations as possible. Now, the idea about this, this is the first step and you're going to validate it now with the one machine. We did this with three machines, actually, the topographer, the, the Pentacam, and the, uh, there was Landstar at that, that, that time, which is the uh, Oculizer. Now, uh, uh, what will the future will be actually, uh, uh, even if you know that the uh, topography uh, in the highly operated eyes are coming from the topography, it is more irregular, but you still need to say, okay, if you take the topography guide repeatment, and you make cornea regular, you don't know what is the impact of that new, more regular cornea on the whole refraction. If you don't have the, the information about where the, cor the, where the retina lies or what is the influence of the lens inside. So the, the real value of this relation uh, 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 profile in device is actually to make all the treatments uh, um, perfect because uh, most of the virgin eyes will still neglect the inside of the eye, which is not going to be important. But those that have highly aberrated corneas, it will benefit tremendously by uh, anticipating what will be the impact of new cornea, more regular ones with this eye, and then making it better so that you can really uh, 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 produce the good and uh, uh, effective ablation profile without increasing the higher aberration. So I'm, I'm very happy that it, the, the project is, is on and uh, 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 just, uh, just go on because it, that's the future, I really think. Well, uh, uh, no, well, may no. I ask some questions? Uh, here we have some questions from the chat. Uh, the first one is about, I believe that uh, it was at the time you were explaining about this uh, new, uh, uh, the new uh, aberration uh, profiles and it, Dr. Milton asked if this is going to be available in the next generation of OPD. And the second question is uh, from Rilo. If sometimes in patients with keratoconus, the refractive axis of astigmatism is closer with the axis of the coma than with the axis of the cornea astigmatism. Uh, can this be explained by aberration terms and can coma changes uh, how or how coma changes the refraction of astigmatism <laughs> okay so the first question regarding uh, opd scan i hope so it's been ready as a software for the last uh, year now but uh, nidec is still uh, moving forward at their pace to to make it happen and 
I think on the last conversation I had with them, it was more a yes than a no, but uh, Mayumi who's from Japan, she knows that sometimes <laughs> it's difficult to know if yes means no, no means yes, no can mean no, and sometimes no means yes, but no. <laughs> but usually almost like they, the French. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So hopefully, but uh, so we'll see. But it could be, it could happen next month because everything is fixed in this thing. The second question is uh, very interesting. And uh, yes, uh, it would res it, it deserves a lot of work. It's not easy. Of course, coma influences vision, and has been said. Yes, astigmatism and coma interplay a lot. It's not straightforward. You can't really predict that if you have coma that direction, it will make as this direction. I would tell you my feeling is that when you have vertical coma, like in keratoconus, it makes sometimes astigmatism in a spectacle, it asks for against the rule astigmatism, negative against the rule astigmatism. The, the problem is that when patients are refracted, they have spectacles, but they still have the coma. And sometimes by chance, the combination of this cylinder orientation, when they look at the E letter, makes the E letter sharper because the E letter is three bars like this. And if you have a combination where the three bars of the E are sharper, even if the bar in the vertical direction is, is not good, then it will uh, create some uh, impression that the vision is better. But still, next day, maybe it's going to be a bit different uh, answer. So there are papers about this, but not enough in the literature which explore the combination between coma and astigmatism. What I can tell you also is if you have think of, of a thought, uh, it's a think, thinking experience. If on a large pupil you only have coma, that would be a patient coming to you with coma. If the pupil constricts asymmetrically toward any direction, if you redo a wave front acquisition, you will still have coma, but now you will have also astigmatism inside the coma. So if you crop around aberration in the Zernikis, um, especially coma, you can give rise to defocus, to uh, to astigmatism. So there are re they have, they, there's a relation there which needs to be explored. But unfortunately, I cannot give you like a recipe of this amount of coma to this axis equals this cylinder. There's probably a population average response, but it's a, it's a tricky question, but very interesting one. Yeah, I think it all depends on how peripheral is the keratoconus. Yes, for keratoconus. For decentration, sometimes, you know, when you, have a, you want to retreat decentration, you're going to do customized topography guided ablation. The question is, do you correct also the refraction of the patient on top of the corneal aberration, or do you adjust it? And it's difficult. In my experience, if you treat the decentration and, and if you treat the refraction, it's, it's not so good because it, part of the refraction astigmatism is caused by the decentration. If you correct the decentration, some of, some of the astigmatism will not be the same uh, so it, it, there is an interplay here which is difficult. So my recipe, recipe is to correct half of the astigmatism when I do recentration. So if I have a patient with minus 280 and the decentration, I would treat the decentration and minus 180, something like that. See? But it's just completely empirical. Yeah, it's empirical yeah. before you start using this innovice because the whole idea about this wave front, uh, the ray tracing relation profile is exactly not to make it empirical anymore because empirically right. you know it should should be that way and know that there is influence of the, the coma. So the, the, I'm, I'm sure that in, in a year time, if you make the same meeting, you will be very happy and jumping around and say, we got it, you know, this is the way to go. <laughs> Finally, we have a software that help us really. Hopefully. But, but, but again, so far, they don't want you to treat anything but normal eyes. So it's a bit frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, imagine us 15 years ago and then I'll combine it. 
<laughs> and then we didn't do anything. Now we're just starting the same point. <laughs> just be patient. Hopefully it happens. There's always a bigger fish, you know. Oh, there is one, one question here that I read, and um, it's, I, I think, both for all of us, for, for both of us, at least. What has been your pre-op routine for refractory surgery after coronavirus? Uh, IgG besides PCR or asked to the patient to start quarantine. There's nothing to do with this, but it is, I think, a, a, a topic that should be addressed. So what do you do? Uh, well, we don't do uh, uh, something special uh, in terms of, uh, of the... Uh, um, how do I yeah. say? A, um, we don't do anything special. I, I'm going to show you, by the way, uh, my waiting room. See, so patient come like here. <laughs> they have masks, and uh, that's it. We don't do PCR or anything like that. So. We're actually doing something similar uh, that we have the guidelines of our uh, um, state that it gave us. So the, one of the things is the maximum amount of patients per, per square meter in the waiting room. We had to address these things. And the basic stuff that you would usually do, is just exactly what uh, Damien showed there. Uh, the patient comes in, cleans the shoes, uh, washes the hands with this disinfectant, put the, the mask. And uh, uh, we, they do the uh, over the telephone. If they show any signs of Anything that could be suspicious, they, they should not come. Uh, but we do not ask them for any, any tests. We are not obliged to do this, and, and we, are, we, don't, we do not do that. Um, uh, I don't know if in Brazil the whole situation it is, if, the, if it's required or not required. It's not required. Uh, this is my, exactly my, the same approach. No special tests for refractive. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So, uh, I'd like to thank for uh, the participation and I'm, I'm really astounded of uh, how easily uh, you can uh, discuss such uh, complicated matters because uh, for those who are not used to it, it really is, is awesome. I'm certain that most of us will watch this like many times on YouTube or <laughs> and have to reveal many things before we can fully uh, or maybe uh, someday partially understand uh, what uh, everything that has been coming today. It was a really high level uh, discussion. I really thank you for uh, the willingness to participate in this meeting and share such a phenomenal uh, knowledge about optics and uh, aberrations, wavefront, and everything. Uh, I, it's, a hon it's an honor to have uh, Dr. Gatnell with us. Also, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Mirko and Mayumi also again uh, participating in our uh, uh, sector. Please, let's do it uh, more because, as I said, it's it's phenomenal. It's it's uh, other. It's another level of <laughs> of discussion. It's not what we are uh, really used to have in these uh, webinars and meetings. You know, uh, I think that's uh, uh, what differentiates this this kind of of meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone. Is my no, no doubt that the level of the discussion in this meeting is special. It's uh, all <laughs> thanks to you two. And I would like to suggest to you to have Damien again for a talk about traffic quality in which he's an expert too about the, uh, this multifocal IOL and et cetera. It's a very, very interesting topic too. So it's an opportunity to have him again. Yeah. It was sure. really a pleasure. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the invite is already done. <laughs> uh, please, uh, anytime, you know, uh, Mirko, Mayomi, uh, Damien, please, please, uh, <laughs> you, you are free to join us anytime. Mirko, please, uh, sorry for interrupting you. No, it's okay. I'm just saying that I'm very happy. Uh, I usually go to Brazil once or twice a year, but this year I'm not really sure how it will happen. But from here, this way is really nice and the platform is great. So we can always uh, uh, do anything. We can do it in Portuguese as well. Uh, if if uh, Damien is not here, uh, some other meeting, but uh, I'm very happy to cooperate. Damien, it's time for you to learn Portuguese now. Huh? 
wife is Portuguese, so so? <laughs> so I need to I need to practice. I need to to benefit from her, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So, Philippe, what's the next? Yeah, uh, so I'll be moving on. Uh, as we are ahead of our time, of, uh, quite a bit ahead of our schedule already, uh, we'll skip the article, so I'll move on to the, our clinical case. Please feel free to stay with us if you can, uh, Dr. Damien, but I, I, there, there's a vision waiting for you, I think. But uh, if Nick and Leo can stay, uh, we can uh, continue it as well. Okay. So, Hi, Damien. Next. Great to see you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you once again, Doctor. Get now. Now back to Portuguese. <laughs> ok. Então voltamos aqui ao português, né? Uh, se você puder compartilhar a sua tela, acho que o caso que a gente trouxe não, não foi combinado, né? Mas uh, acho que vai um pouco com o que o Dr. Mirko uh, comentou durante a discussão. Não vou dar mais spoilers, mas segue o jogo, por favor. Não dá para ouvir, Fernanda. Eu acho que agora deu, né? Sim, tá certo. Um bom dia a todos. É, eu sou a Fernanda, sou uma das, das fellows desse ano de catarata refrativa da ótica cirúrgica. E eu vou apresentar um caso que realmente tem a ver com o um assunto que estava sendo discutido. E eu quero fazer um agradecimento especial à doutora Juliana Okimoto e à doutora Zaira Nicolau, que também fazem parte do, do serviço e ajudaram conduzindo o caso e, e buscando os registros. Aqui. Não tem nenhum conflito de interesse com a apresentação. E os slides estão em inglês, porque talvez a apresentação seria em inglês, então peço desculpas, mas é uma paciente do sexo feminino de 32 anos, trabalha como policial, e ela veio ah, para a primeira consulta com uma vontade de reduzir a dependência de óculos, porque isso interferia nas atividades diárias dela, no trabalho. Ela já tinha tentado fazer uso de lente de contato, mas não tinha tido sucesso. Não conseguiu se adaptar. Não tinha nenhuma história médica pregressa digna de nota. E na história oftalmológica, ela tinha um trauma contuso no olho direito há 30 anos atrás mas que não precisou de tratamento cirúrgico, nenhum outro acompanhamento a mais. Só esse relato. No exame oftalmológico, então, ela tinha uma acuidade visual não corrigida de 20 100 no olho direito e 20 80 no olho esquerdo. E a acuidade visual corrigida, com a, tanto com a refração dela, em uso há mais ou menos um ano, que era de menos 2 com menos 1,25 a 100 no olho direito e menos 2 com menos 6 a 70 no olho esquerdo, quanto com a refração estática, ciclopegiada, de menos 1,25 de esférico, menos 1,75 de cilindro e a 95 de eixo no olho direito e no olho esquerdo menos 1,5 de esférico, menos meio de cilindro a, em eixo de 80. Nos dois olhos ela ficava com uma acuidade visual corrigida de 20 15. E na biomicroscopia anterior, a pressão intraocular e a fundoscopia não tinha nada digno de nota o exame dentro da normalidade, não tinha alterações sugestivas de dano por aquele trauma que ela contava de 30 anos atrás. Então, foi feito a tomografia é, com Scheinflug, com Pentacan, da paciente. Esse aqui é o, o exame do olho direito. Então, dá para ver aqui que é uma corna espessa, com uma paquimetria no ponto mais fino de 590 micrômetros. E nos mapas de elevação não tinha nada sugestivo de um risco de maior de ectasia, algum fator de risco. No olho esquerdo também uma córnea espessa com ponto mais fino de 588 e também com os mapas de elevação compatíveis com a normalidade sem, sem alterações sugestivas de um risco maior de ectasia. E aqui tem os dois olhos, né? o olho direito é, com a, refra, a refração dela na consulta é a, Cicloplegiada era menos 1,25, menos 1,75 a 95. 
Mas ela mostrou aqui na córnea um astigmatismo de 0,3 na superfície anterior e 0,1 na superfície posterior. E no olho esquerdo, com aquela refração com meio de cilindro, ela também tinha meio de cilindro na, no exame corneano, mas esse, esse meio era em outro eixo, então não era compatível com a refração cicloplegiada. Então, de hipóteses diagnósticas para esse caso, é, a gente tem um astigmatismo miópico composto nos dois olhos e um astigmatismo interno é, mais marcante no olho direito, já que o astigmatismo seria de 0,3 na córnea no olho direito e de menos 1,75 na refração e de meio no olho esquerdo, compatível com a mesma quantidade no olho esquerdo, mas com um eixo diferente da refração. Aqui tem a reconstrução 3D, que, que dá para ver essa, essa imagem mais para ilustrar que a córnea tem um padrão mais homogêneo, ali, mais, mais regular, enquanto na parte interna a gente vê que tem até aquele formato de chip que o Dr. Gastinel tinha falado, que sugere o astigmatismo interno. Tá. E, então foi feito uh, o exame de aberrometria com o iDesign. Esse aqui é o exame do olho direito. E nesse mapa aqui, superior esquerdo, a gente mostra o total de aberrações de alta ordem. E na distribuição dá para ver que as principais foram o trifóio, como primeira, depois o coma e a aberração esférica. No olho esquerdo, é, as mesmas três como principais, mas é, teve um, o coma mais ressaltado que o trifóio nesse caso. Então aqui é o exame do OPD no olho direito. É, demonstrando o astigmatismo total do olho aqui na, na esquerda, né? E isso é, fica diferente na parte corneana e a parte interna, então dá para ver aqui bem ilustrado o astigmatismo interno, bem diferente do astigmatismo corneano e compatível com o eixo refracional da paciente. Isso no olho direito, que tinha um cilindro maior. Aqui a gente tem a, o exame das aberrações de alta ordem. Então, mostrando as mesmas aberrações que tinha mostrado no iDesign e também com o trifoil se ressaltando entre as três. Aqui mesmo, só para ilustrar. No olho esquerdo, também tem esse, é, esse astigmatismo interno demonstrado ali na figura, fica mais fácil de visualizar e que é mais compatível com o eixo refracional da paciente do que o astigmatismo corneano. Aqui a gente tem as aberrações de alta ordem do olho esquerdo, também aquelas mesmas três, mas aqui se ressaltando mais o trifóio, enquanto no iDesign, no olho esquerdo estava é, com prevalência do coma. Aqui o mesmo para ilustrar. Então o manejo dessa paciente em conjunto com a paciente, com as necessidades dela, foi optado por fazer a cirurgia refrativa e entre as duas técnicas que a gente costuma fazer do PRK ou do LASIK, foi optado por fazer LASIK, ela não tinha uma contraindicação ao LASIK. E a programação cirúrgica foi baseada na refração estática da paciente. Então aqui é o procedimento no olho direito, dá para ver que a pupila está bem centrada, a espessura do flap foi de 110 micro, o estroma residual ficou de 430, e ali o perfil de ablação ilustrado com aquela refração de menos 1,25 esférico, menos 1,75 cilindro e 95 de eixo. No olho esquerdo, é, também a pupila centrada, um estroma residual de 440, dá para ver que o perfil de ablação já corresponde a muito menos astigmatismo do que no olho direito, né, porque aqui ela tem um componente esférico mais importante. E no pós-operatório, no segmento da paciente, é, no olho direito, com um mês depois do procedimento, o flap estava centrado, a acuidade visual estava 20-20 com correção de menos meio a 180 de cilindro só. O paciente estava satisfeita. Foi feito é, os procedimentos com intervalo de duas semanas entre os dois olhos. Então, no olho esquerdo, com um mês da cirurgia, ela ficou com 20-20 e sem é, uma refração, um grau refracional residual, então ficou com plano. E a paciente estava bastante satisfeita, não, não tinha queixas. Então, estava é, realmente insatisfeita com o resultado cirúrgico. Esse aqui é o Pentacan antes e depois da cirurgia, né? Esse do meio pré-op, depois do pós-op e o mapa diferencial. A cirurgia não teve nenhuma intercorrência, nem no pós-operatório, né? No olho esquerdo também, aqui mostrando 
o mapa diferencial. E pensando nesse caso, vou citar só alguns artigos, então esse aqui é um artigo canadense que é, avaliou, comparou, né, em 1.274 óleos submetidos à LASIK, ele dividiu em dois grupos, um grupo em que o eixo, o eixo tratado foi baseado na topografia, no, no eixo topográfico, e o outro grupo baseado no eixo refracional do paciente. Então, nesse estudo, é, eles viram que, de acordo com o grau de, a, do eixo, do, do astigmatismo, teria diferença ou não entre, a, entre as duas escolhas. Então, quando tinha uma, uma discrepância de até 20 graus no eixo do cilindro, não, não teve diferença significativa. Mas se tinha uma discrepância de 20 a 45 graus, nos pacientes que tiveram o um tratamento com um eixo topo guiado, é, foi, tiveram resultados inferiores, refracionais, mais queixas pelos pacientes, então é, nesses casos com uma discrepância maior faz mais diferença essa escolha pelo, pelo eixo refracional do paciente em vez do corneal. Esse outro estudo tem como um dos autores o professor Mário Campos, né, nosso chefe do departamento, então, mostrando o estudo das aberrações oculares com a idade. Então, aqui, esse, esses gráficos estão mostrando em relação a aberrações de alta ordem, mostrando que isso aumenta a prevalência com a idade, né? E na córnea, isso tem se mantido constante ao longo das faixas etárias, enquanto no cristalino, é, isso é bem compatível com a alteração de aberração de alta ordem com o passar dos anos. Então, provavelmente, mais secundário às vezes, que... É, nos faz pensar principalmente nos pacientes com idade um pouquinho maior, mais de meia idade, próximo aos 40 anos, que isso tem que ser levado bastante em consideração. E esse outro artigo é americano e avaliou a eficácia do, do LASIK na correção de astigmatismo corneano é, anterior ou não anterior, fazendo um estudo comparativo, então eles avaliaram 61 olhos de 61 pacientes e dividiram em um grupo, em que tinha um, um baixo astigmatismo residual ocular, ou seja, a maioria do astigmatismo era devido à córnea, né? era, ela, era pela toricidade corneana, e no outro grupo com um alto astigmatismo ocular residual, o ORA, é, ou seja, com astigmatismo interno mais importante. Então, nos pacientes que tiveram é, um baixo astigmatismo, tinham baixo astigmatismo residual, então seria mais secundário às alterações corneanas mesmo, é, eles tiveram 75% de sucesso de tratamento do astigmatismo. Agora, nos pacientes que já tinham um componente não corneano, não, não da superfície anterior, pelo menos maior, esse sucesso caiu para 50% dos casos. 50% do, do, da quantidade de astigmatismo, né, na verdade. Então, para pensar, assim, a partir desse caso, algumas conclusões ou, ou aspectos que a gente tem que levar em consideração, que o astigmatismo, ele normalmente, na maioria dos casos, ele é devido à toricidade da superfície anterior da córnea, mas a gente tem que lembrar que em, em alguns pacientes é, existem elementos que não fazem parte da superfície anterior da córnea, que a gente chama desses do ORA, que é o Ocular Residual Astigmatism, e nesses casos a gente tem que pensar em qual abordagem seria melhor para ter um resultado melhor no final da, do procedimento refrativo. Então, se é feita ah, nesses casos, né, o, o astigmatismo, o tratamento é, guiado pela topografia, não seria a melhor abordagem, então seria melhor que a gente considerasse um tratamento baseado ou na refração do paciente, que seria o tratamento convencional, ou wavefront guided nas, nas aberrações do paciente que levasse em consideração todos os elementos oculares e não só a parte corneana. E outra coisa a ser levada em consideração é que a quantidade de astigmatismo que é criado iatrogenicamente nesses casos, ele pode afetar também a qualidade visual pós-operatória. Então, é, isso inclusive depois para casos que vão ser submetidos à cirurgia de catarata ou é, enfim, outros procedimentos, também a gente vai causar um, um astigmatismo corneano para compensar esse astigmatismo interno nesses casos, né? Seria isso. Legal. Muito obrigado, viu, Fernanda. É, 
Eu gostaria de fazer algumas... Primeiro, agradecer a Juliana Kimoto, que estava aqui com a gente, só que eu acho que ela teve que sair, que que manejou esse caso aí brilhantemente. E eu gostaria de abrir para... E também a Zaira, né, que apresentou esse caso, foi apresentado recentemente no Brown Round, mas é uma outra uma outra discussão lá. Aqui, vocês viram hoje a coisa um pouquinho mais <risos> aprofundada. Eu vou passar para o Dr. Mirko. Uh, por favor, eu gostaria de... assim né, O senhor tinha comentado sobre a, essa questão, né quando não se encontra, quando a, a, a origem das aberrações não está propriamente na córnea, se... Uh, quando a gente mexe nessa uh, superfície, se é, seria o local mais adequado para esse tipo de tratamento, enfim, abrir para esse lado da discussão. E emendando, tinha uma pergunta do Rida aqui que chegou um pouco depois, mas que eu acho que cabe aqui também, né? Que olhando para o futuro aí da cirurgia refrativa, se acha que tem alguma tendência a se corrigir esses erros uh, refrativos, ou qualquer uh, mesmo né, aberração, na córnea, no cristalino, se melhor lentes fáscas, ou se vai existir um método aí que misture uh, esses locais de, de, de correção. Opa, está no mudo, doutor Mico. Uh, se você puder só colocar no slide de uh, pré-op, uh, manifesta e, e cicloplégica, só para ver. Do, do olho direito, que está mais interessante, só para ver uma coisa. E no final, só não anotei qual era o, o pós-operatório do olho direito? Qual era o quê, doutor? Pós-operatório, a refração pós-operatória do direito. Ficou plano com menos meia, 180. Menos meio, ó. Então, olha aqui. É, Tem que corrigir o meio. É, mas o, o, o inverteu o eixo. Isso que hiper eu dizer. Corrigiu, é, hiper corrigiu. É, então, eu acho que assim, pensa, isso é uma coisa muito interessante para você pensar. É, você faz cicloplegia sempre, que tem que fazer para ver, o para relaxar a acomodação. Nesse sentido, você quer medir ah, o grau de miopia ou hipermetropia, nesse caso de miopia, correto, sem influência de acomodação. Isso significa que ah, você supõe que ah, os, as zônulas são ah, ah, perfeitamente ah, bem espalhadas pelo cristalino e que a elasticidade de cristalino está perfeita, portanto, quando solta o, o músculo ciliar, o cristalino vai se ah, abaular da maneira correta e uniforme. E isso é correto quando você não tem é, mudança, isso, isso se fosse desse jeito, você não teria mudança no, no, no astigmatismo. Você tem é, astigmatismo que mudou bastante entre, é, entre é, olha antes o, o, a, a manifesta, a manifesta aqui embaixo, não? A, 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 a refração manifesta do direito, isso que eu, eu acho que não tem. Tinha, tinha refração, o óculos em uso pela paciente. Era o óculos que ela usava, não era refração dinâmica. Ok, mas é, uh, isso, é, isso tem, tem que... Uh, óculos também são coisa importante. Você tem que checar, uh, re, uh, ver o grau. Uh, eu achei que era uh, uh, a refração uh, manifesta. Uh, pode ser que seja, pode ser que não seja, mas uh, você tem que ter esse dado quanto que é, qual é a refração uh, uh, manifesta. Porque nos casos... Vou interromper aqui, Dr. Mirko. Vou fazer uma meia culpa. Que eu que falei para a Fernanda tirar que tinha muita informação. Desculpa, é. viu, Fernanda. Ela, ela fez e ela colocou no slide. Ali. Quanto que é? Mas eu falo, me fala se é meio grau essa diferença ou não. Porque tem que ser era meio bem, grau. Era bem parecido com o grau do óculos dela em uso. Pois é. Então, isso, que bom que foi exatamente isso que eu quero dizer. É, normalmente, você tem que tomar muito cuidado. É, a minha regra, se, se você volta para o exemplo do cristalino, é, ele deveria se comportar desse jeito, mas é, pode ser um pouco assimétrico e na maneira que solta, ele pode modificar o formato dele e ele é, causar o osteomotismo mudar. É, ele pode mudar o eixo, que você já, já mediu, esses 5 graus não faz diferença, mas ele pode mudar o grau também. Só que isso não, não deve ser influenciado, minha opinião é, não, eu nunca uso o grau do astigmatismo que eu medi na cicloplegia. Nem o eixo, nem o grau. Eu volto e depois, se eu tenho uma discrepância, eu vou checar de novo a manifesta. Eu vou usar o, o valor da, da refração do, 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 da esfera do, do cicloplégico, mas eu vou usar o, o, o valor do astigmatismo porque esse é o formato de, do, do cristalino que é natural. Isso que, que, que aconteceu, provavelmente o grau dela era um 25 a 100, 
você é, colocou a, a, a ciclopédico, modificou o formato de cristalino, mediu mais, e o cristalino vai voltar quando estiver funcionando normalmente. E esse, o, o, a correção a mais, que você, esse mais, me, menos meio, inverteu o eixo, porque foi hipercorrigido, não precisava ter corrigido isso. Isso coisa em, em geral, essa é a minha regra, uso sempre a manifesta, uh, o valor e o eixo do astigmatismo, uh, e uh, uso a, 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 a cicloplégica da, da esfera. Eu checo de novo isso antes de fazer a cirurgia. Agora, a pergunta é sobre a, a influência do, uh, da, das uh, aberrações internas, externas, e na córnea e não na córnea. Esse é um caso muito complicado a dizer, porque é mais ou menos aquilo que falou o Demir. É uma filosofia é uma coisa, mas na realidade você tem que decidir o que você vai fazer. É, no caso desses, é, é, seria mais ou menos uma, uma coisa parecida, pensando se você vai é, colocar a lente tórica é, num paciente de catarata, lá dois milímetros atrás do, do, da córnea, que tem o um astigmatismo em cima para compensar. Então, você pode, tem dois elementos, eles podem se sobreposicionar sobre, sobre e podem influenciar, influenciar um ou outro. Então, se você colocar um grau de, a mais, em geral, de astigmatismo da manifesta que não existe na córnea, não vai fazer uma, uma distorção ótica significante. Em outras palavras, se você mediu menos 2 nesse paciente, menos 1,75, um na córnea você viu, viu só o meio, você não tem problema de hipercorrigir na córnea. Então, essa é outra coisa, não é a mesma coisa como mudar o eixo por causa da ciclopegia. Então, nesse sentido, você a influência, a influência da, da, do que tem dentro do olho, das aberrações internas, você não pode, no ponto de vista do high order operations, eu acho que deveria deixar, paciente jovem. Eu iria mesmo como se vocês fizeram só o tratamento normal, de Wavefront Optimize, então não incluindo as avaliações de alta ordem, o que eu faria, teria feito diferente é só é, teria usado o valor do astigmatismo e o eixo do astigmatismo manifesta junto com o valor da esfera é, ciclobésica. Do, do esquerdo está certo. Entendi. Posso fazer um comentário, Kaguchi? Claro, professor, fica à vontade. É... Me conhecer um paciente interessante, é um paciente que veio no, no meu dia de ambulatório com a Juliana, Okimoto, né? Uh, é raro um astigmatismo interno, melhor ainda, é raro um astigmatismo cristaliniano desse tanto. E, infelizmente, nós não temos nenhuma ferramenta que identifique o astigmatismo cristaliniano. Então, eu acho que a beleza desse caso, e, e, e a Juliana parou no 90%, faltou o que eu falei para ela, que eu queria que ela fizesse mais uma coisinha que ela não fez, uh, mas a beleza desse caso está naquele vídeo. Né, se a Fernanda puser pôr o vídeo, é a única maneira que a gente tem de realmente provar que esse paciente tinha um astigmatismo cristaliniano é usando o vídeo do Scheinflug, que é, é, é subjetivo, né? eu não, tenho, não consigo analisar para que ela vai pôr. Porque nós vimos o caso, eu falei, oh, tem, é muito interessante, né? porque você não vê isso. Né? Você não vê esse... esse essa, esse astigmatismo cristaliniano dessa maneira, né? E o que chama a atenção é que ele parece ser mais posterior do que anterior, né? Mas assim que muda o, o cristalino, assim que de trás ele vai, para frente ele vai muito pouco. O, o, é, a... mais o a face posterior. Mas eu pedi para ela fazer um visante, ainda dá tempo para ela fazer, uh, e eu queria medir essas curvaturas nos meridianos do astigmatismo da paciente. A gente consegue fazer isso usando o Image J e saber qual é o raio de curvatura do cristalino anterior e posterior a partir da ima... de um meridiano. Né? Eu não consigo fazer um mapa, mas eu consigo fazer um meridiano. A Scheinflug, o Pentacan, no caso, poderia nos dar essa informação, mas eles não dão. Se eu tivesse esse raw data, eu conseguiria. Mas, mas com... se eu tiver no meridiano, vai ficar interessante. Então, uh, seria interessante se a Juliana voltasse a fazer isso aí. A beleza daquele software que a gente estava falando, de ray tracing, ou agora que ele chamou de outro jeito, é, Inovais, exatamente é essa, que ela, ela poderia, poderia integrar todas as informações, inclusive essa, te daria exatamente a informação de onde vem a aberração e quais, de, quais, dessa, quais delas que você vai querer corrigir ou não. Felipe, com você. 
Bom, pessoal, a gente já está bem adiantado aí no horário. Eu agradeço a todos pela participação. Nós vamos acabar encerrando por aqui. Eu peço desculpas ao Gabriel, mas nós vamos deixar a apresentação do artigo para uma próxima oportunidade, tudo bem? Eu gostaria novamente de agradecer. O doutor Mayumi teve que sair um pouquinho mais cedo aqui, não pôde se juntar a nós nessa, nesse final de discussão. E o doutor Gatinel também, né, pela participação. E Mirko, muitíssimo obrigado por ficar conosco aqui até o final. É... Gostaria Olha, já novamente estamos aqui de fora, tem o sol, sexta-feira à tarde. <risos> com vocês, Ai, que tá gostoso aí. E, e, e parabenizar o assim, nível da discussão, né? Foi tremendo. É, pessoal, na semana que vem uh, teremos aula de voltamos para o tema de catarata teremos aula aí uh, com o Pedro Carriconto sobre trauma e catarata e a doutora Norma, que eu não sei se ainda está com a gente que apresentará também uma aula de imagem no trauma de segmento anterior tá bom? Então eu desejo a todos um bom dia um bom final de semana e uma boa semana novamente, obrigado Obrigado pelo convite tchau Tchau, Mirko. Prazerzão, hein? Sempre.